hello everyone welcome to my youtube channel today we will um focus a bit on the senzo meiwa trial and uh, we will look at a uh, few aspects that have been um or elements that have been at display in the in the trial so basically um in south africa uh Offenses are classified into different um, schedules based on their severity and nature. They are typically categorized um, under various schedules in accordance with uh, the specific legislation that governs them, such as the Criminal Procedure Act, the Drugs and Drug Trafficking Act, and others. For instance, uh, the Drug and uh, Drug uh, Trafficking Act categorize, categorizes drugs-related offenses into uh, different schedules based on the severity of the offenses um, and the type of substance involved. These schedules range from Schedule 1, uh, which include substances like heroin and cocaine, to Schedule 7, which include substances like cannabis. Then, um, murder is typically classified under common law as the unlawful and intentional killing of another person. The punishment for murder can vary depending on the circumstances of the crime, but it can range from long prison sentences to life sentence. Um... Then uh, let's discuss another um, controversial uh, factor in this proceedings, um, which is witchcraft. So in the Senzo Meiwa case, we have seen and heard of traditional healers playing a part in some way or the other through both defense and the state. So we'll address a bit part with little knowledge I have. So, we have the Witchcraft Suppression Act of 1957 as a law in South Africa. This prohibits various activities related to witchcraft. It criminalizes practices such as claiming to have supernatural powers, using charms or divination to cause harm, and accusing others of witchcraft. However, it's worth noting that um, enforcement of this law has been controversial as it can sometimes be used to target vulnerable individuals or perpetuate harmful beliefs and practices. But in some countries, including South Africa as well, um, there have been instances where accusations related to witchcraft or claims of supernatural events have been brought into court proceedings. However, the acceptance of such evidence varies widely depending on the legal system and the specific, and the specific circumstances of the case. In many modern legal systems, evidence presented in court is expected to be based on verifiable facts, scientific evidence, witness testimony, and other tangible forms of evidence. Claims of witchcraft or supernatural events typically do not meet this criteria and may be viewed as hearsay or anecdotal, which means evidence is based only on personal observation and collected in a casual or non-systematic manner. Then, in some cases, where cultural or religious beliefs play a significant role in a community, there might be instances where allegations related to witchcraft are considered relevant to the case. In such situations, court court may uh, need to uh, navigate carefully to ensure fair treatment and adherence to legal principles. Sorry. So, the acceptance 
of witchcraft-related evidence in court proceedings is rare in modern legal systems and is more likely to occur in contexts where traditional beliefs hold significant sway. But in court, but um, courts don't have measures in place to make findings on cases of witchcraft. Then another um, aspect uh, that we have seen in these proceedings is the issue of um, alibi. So we have seen the state bringing the bank statements to rebut the defense alibi, tying cell phone numbers to bank statements, um, reading out transactions at certain times, dates, and locations. So basically, an alibi is a defense strategy where a person proves they were elsewhere when a crime occurred. Then that may assert their innocence. It also serves to cast doubt on their involvement in the crime by providing evidence of their location at the time of the incident. So here we've seen the state again um, proving this um, accused whereabouts through uh, transactions, but that is the dates near or after uh, near the date, which is just before um, the incident happened and after, and some of the uh, transactions they have actually read out in court, they are way after that. And then we've seen some of um, the evidence being as, as uh, late as 2018, 2020. I mean, um, that is just to say that this number belongs to this person and this person has this account and um, this person has used this account at this place, at this point, at this time, at, you know, um, but the state is actually trying to rebut the defense um, alibi um, through that evidence. So the other aspect that we we have to look at it's um section 219 which is interesting as well um section 219 of the criminal procedure act um outlines the admissibility of confessions in court it states that a confession made by an accused person is admissible as evidence against them if it is proved to have been freely and voluntarily made. However, if there are any doubts about its voluntariness, the court may exclude it from evidence. Additionally, the court must consider the circumstances under which the confession was made, including any inducements or threats. So, in this case of um, CAS 636, of uh, uh, 2014 uh, of the murder of uh, Senzo Meiwa. Confession of accused number one, who is Muzi Sibia, is said to be misleading by the investigative officers, or we can say um, the state at this stage. So they are saying that it is misleading largely because of the names of the alleged intruders provided by the confessor, who is Muzi Sibia. So Muzi Sibia um, said that in his um, alleged confession that he stood outside and the people who entered the house was um, Makimba Butelezi, and Marco Butelezi. So the state has found that one of them was actually in prison at the time of this incident 
that is the evidence that we have had in court. So they concluded that this is misleading. But be that as it may, the state says that the confession is not entirely misleading as the accused admits having been at the crime scene. So the accused allegedly places himself at the crime scene, but the onus is upon the state to prove all elements to secure a conviction. They then rely heavily on, conf on con confession of accused number two, who is Bonganin Tanzi. So at this point, let me tell you that even confession of accused number two is equally misleading if we put it up against the evidence of the eyewitnesses from the house. Accused number two says he allegedly went in the house where crime was committed with accused number three, who is um, Carlos Mnube. Um, he also says that accused number one was outside as a watchdog, which corroborates confession of accused number one on that point. But what is controversial or misleading in that confession is that he places accused number four, who is Mtogosiseni Mapisa, by saying that accused number four allegedly took a position by the window when they entered the house of the Kumalos. Then accused number four later went in the house after the incident or during those final stages of the incident. Um, so what we see now is that we have Mtogozi Sitwala, who is an eyewitness who was in the house when this occurred, this incident occurred. Mtogozi Sitwala ran out of the house after the first shot, if I can recollect correctly, but you can correct me on that point uh, in the comment section. So, Mtogosi Stwala ran out of the house and was allegedly chased by accused number two. Then how did accused number two see accused number four go in the house if he ran out to the opposite direction of Mtogosi Stwala? Because Mtogosi Stwala says he ran this way and then accused number two ran this way. So... Mtogo also went back to the house, to, to the yard but did not see accused number three and accused number four leaving the yard or the house. What is worse is that we heard Zandi saying that she was peeping Begapopola in her own words through the door to see what was happening but she did not see accused number four entering the house as accused number as, uh, as, as, as the third intruder and no witness speaks of accused number four thus far no eyewitness from outside the house has seen the events as in the confessions to corroborate in its completeness and consistency but I will leave it there for now. Let's go to section 205. Section 205 of the Criminal Procedure Act in South Africa deals with admissibility of evidence obtained through electronic communication, which includes cell phone evidence. So there is procedure, sorry, in acquiring this evidence. But 
Let's start with the importance of this evidence before we go to the procedure. The importance of this evidence, um, Section 205 helps to ensure that electronic evidence, including cell phone uh, data, is properly handled and presented in court, maintaining the fairness of the trial process. It establishes procedures of the collection, preservation, and presentation of electronic evidence, safeguarding its integrity and authenticity. Adhering to Section 205 ensures that evidence collected meets legal standards, preventing its exclusion or dismissal on proceedings, on, proced on uh, procedural grounds, if I should say it that way. Okay, then what is the procedure followed to acquire this evidence? So basically, the procedure from the beginning to the end of this evidence would be um, looking at obtaining a warrant, securing the evidence, forensic analysis, documentation of this evidence, um, admissibility hearing, trial presentation, and judicial consideration. So before assessing um, before accessing uh, cell phone evidence, law enforcement typically needs to obtain a warrant from a judicial officer demonstrating probable cause for the search and seizure. Once authorized, law enforcement must secure the cell phone or relevant electronic evidence and any associated data promptly to prevent tampering or loss of evidence. Then after... A qualified forensic analyst examines the electronic data, including call logs, text messages, GPS data, and other relevant information to, ex to extract evidence related to the case. Then, detailed documentation of the evidence collection process is crucial, including chain of custody records, forensic reports, and other relevant documentation to ensure transparency and accountability. Before, before trial, the admissibility of cell phone evidence under Section 205 may be challenged by the defense or assessed by the court in a separate hearing. The prosecution must demonstrate compliance with legal procedures and the reliability of the evidence. If deemed admissible, the cell phone evidence, evidence can be presented during the trial along with any ex, uh, expert testimony um, supporting its authenticity and relevance um, to the case. Then the judge or the magistrate considers the cell phone evidence along with other factors in uh, reaching a verdict, weighing its probative value against any potential prejudicial effect. So following the procedures outlined in Section 205 helps ensure that evidence is properly handled, um, authenticated and presented in court, contributing to the fair and effective administration of justice. But then the question may arise or whether if this evidence can be disputed. So while it's possible for evidence, including cell phone evidence, to be presented in a manner that makes it difficult for the defense to dispute, it's not guaranteed that the evidence will be undisputed. So there are factors um, to consider uh, when disputing uh, this um, evidence. So the accuracy and reliability of the forensic analysis conducted on the cell phone evidence can influence its credibility. If the forensic methods used are sound and the analysis is thorough, it may be harder for the defense to dispute the evidence. Then a clear and unbroken chain of custody for the cell phone evidence is crucial. If there are any gaps 
or inconsistencies in how the evidence was handled and stored, the defense may raise questions about its integrity and reliability. During trial, the defense has the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses, including forensic experts, who analyze the cell phone evidence or any electronic evidence. They may raise doubts about the methods used, the interpretation of the data, or the qualifications of the expert, which could lead to dispute over the evidence. Then the defense may present alternative explanations for the cell phone evidence, such as, such as suggesting that um, someone else had access to the device or that uh, the data was tampered with or fabricated. This can create disputes over the interpretation and significance of the evidence. Then the defense may also dispute the admissibility of the cell phone evidence on legal grounds, such as arguing that it was obtained unlawfully or that there were violations of the defendant's rights during the collection process. So while the cell phone evidence can be presented in a manner that makes it challenging uh, for the defense to dispute, it's not uncommon for disputes to arise during trial. The extent of which the evidence is undisputed depends on factors such as the quality of the forensic analysis, the strength of the chain of custody, the effectiveness of the cross-examination, and the process or and the, the presence of alternative uh, explanations uh, or legal arguments. So what faults can be found in this evidence? Cell phone evidence, like any other evidence, can have various faults such as vulnerabilities that the defense may seek to exploit. There are potential uh, 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 factors that can be found. Um, hence, there are potential faults um, that can be found uh, in this uh, evidence. The defense may question whether the cell phone defense presented in court is authentic and has not been tempered with, tempered with or fabricated. This could include raising doubts about the integrity of the data, um, such as whether it may be altered or manipulated. So that basically um, it's authentication issues, chain of custody concerns, uh, data integrity problems and expert, and expert testimony challenges. And also um, what is found as um, alternative explanations um, from the defense, you know, and then um, the defense may challenge the admissibility. So in overall, um, faults in cell phone evidence can arise from issues related to authenticity chain of custody, as I've explained, um, data integrity, expert testimony, alternative explanations, and legal challenges. The defense may exploit these vulnerabilities to undermine the credibility and reliability of the evidence presented in the prosecution. Then, um, lastly, what I would um, like to say is that we know that the trial of CAS 636 of 2014 in the matter of Senzo Meiwa is mostly weighed sorry, on circumstantial evidence. There are cases that have demonstrated that circumstantial evidence can play a crucial role in establishing guilt in criminal cases, provided it meets certain criteria such as consistency, inference, corroboration, and completeness. So in the next video, I will go in um, a broader way of trying to um, explain um, circumstantial evidence. Uh, I will discuss these criteria and uh, the case laws that have uh, been uh, that have drawn all these aspects to reach good judgment. 
let me know what you think don't forget to like